I heard about a certain minister who had a uh, had a weakness for golf, but he didn't have any time for it. And uh, searching his kind of his busy schedule, he he found one day of year that he could play. Unfortunately, uh, that day fell uh, on the Sabbath, and so the minister sort of apologized to God and traveled to a far off golf course to this to this golf club, so no one would know him. And so. As he teed up on this hole number one, uh, an angel looks down from heaven and is sort of aghast that here's a minister playing golf on the Sabbath, and then he goes and, and sort of inquires to the Lord about it. And, and so uh, God sends down this gust of wind uh, on the third hole, and the minister's ball, it sinks in the cup. It's a hole in one. And, and the angel's sort of taken aghast and what, what, what's going on here, God? What, you call that a punishment? And the Lord said, think about it. Who can he tell? <laughs> well, we're continuing our uh, series in the Ten Commandments today, and we come to the fourth commandment, of, of, uh, which is remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 20, and um, uh, we're going to be in verse 8. Um, in the beginning of this series, I told you that as we study through this Ten Commandments, that you really could be divided up into two parts. Um, so if you take a look at the Ten Commandments here, you know, the first four could be, we could say that these are um, commandments that deal with our relationship with God, and then the, the last six uh, deal with our, our relationship with man. Some people have referred to these as vertical commands or horizontal commands. And, and I think it's fine to think of it that way, but really these are all vertical commands, right? Because they all have to do with our relationship with God. If God, and we said from the very beginning, if God isn't the reason we're truth-telling people or morally honest, pure people or honoring our father and mother type people, then the Ten Commandments are just mere suggestions sort of for a nice society. But if you're a believer, these commands have authority. And they have authority because God spoke them into existence. In fact, if you take a look at Exodus chapter 20, the very first verse, maybe that's the most important at all, because it says this. It says, and God spoke all these words. And so if you believe that God spoke all these words here in the Ten Commandments and the rest of the words that we find in Scripture in this book, this is, this, if that's the case, then this is no longer just any book. This is the only book that matters. And so let's take a look at it. And let's see what this book has to say. Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to be at verse 8, begin at verse 8. It says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner, uh, residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now I'm guessing that for most of us that we fall into sort of one or two groups as it pertains to our understanding of the Sabbath. The, the first group would be a group that says, well, the Sabbath is still applicable for the church today, and it's, it's been moved from Saturday to Sunday. And so that, that would mean that today would be a Sabbath day. And for those of you in that camp, you may be concerned today that I'm going to give you a list of what you can or you can't do on uh, Sunday. And so that list might include you can't work on Sunday, or you, uh, you, know, you can't shop at Walmart on Sunday, or uh, you can't cook a meal on Sunday. Maybe some of you, are, maybe ladies especially, like, yes, please say that. Or, God forbid, you can't make someone else work on Sunday, right? And, you, and that means that you can't go out to eat, on, you know. And we, we would shut down the Mexican restaurant and, and pizza factory all in one if, if that were the case. We'd put them out of business. Uh, the second group would be maybe those who believe that the Sabbath no longer applies whatsoever. And so that group would just see every day as the same. doesn't matter if it's Sunday, Saturday, Monday, whatever. All days are alike. And since the Sabbath no longer applies, then we aren't obligated to follow it. And so if we choose to work seven days a week and treat Sunday like any other day, well, that's our prerogative. Well, who's right? Uh, what, what's, the, what's the right answer here? Well, before we attempt to answer that question, let's talk briefly about the original intent of the Sabbath. 
and why God gave Israel the Sabbath in the first place. And we talked about this not too long ago, so this beginning of this message may be a refresher for some of you. Let me, let me give you a few reasons why the Sabbath existed originally. First of all, it was a day to honor and worship God. Deuteronomy 5.15 reads, Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. And so the Sabbath originally was a reminder to the people of Israel of how God had rescued them from the hands of the Egyptians from slavery. And as a result, God says, now, you didn't, no longer you have to work seven days a week. In fact, intentionally, you're going to take one day off to understand that you're no longer a slave. Slaves don't get a day off from work. And so the Sabbath was a weekly reminder of Israel, of God's great mercy in their life, how he had freed them from slavery in Egypt. Secondly, it was a sign of God's covenant to Israel. It was a sign. Sometimes um, covenants had signs that would accompany, accompany them. Okay, remember, for example, God's covenant with Noah. Remember the, the sign that accompanied that covenant it was a rainbow. Uh, remember God's covenant with Abraham. The sign that accompanied that was, was circumcision. And the Sabbath served as a symbol or a sign to other nations that Israel had been called out by the people, were, were the called out people by the God, the very God who created our world in six days and then rested on the seventh. It says it like this in Exodus 31. It says, the Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he abstained from work and rested. And so the Sabbath, was a, uh, to, uh, the Sabbath for Israel was depicting what God had done in creation in their very lives. It was a very powerful symbol. And so third, and then thirdly, it was a benefit to those who observed it. The Sabbath originally was a benefit. Uh, Isaiah 56, 2 says, Bless is the person who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating. Now, you know what that word Sabbath means? It, it just simply means rest. And God wanted his people to benefit from rest and relaxation. But notice in our passage, or our original passage, if you still have it there in front of you, in Exodus 20, that it wasn't only just the Israelites who benefited from this rest, but it was all those who were in their presence. Um, their servants benefited as well. And so maybe perhaps for the first time in history, people began to view uh, slaves as actual people and to be treated as such. Not only were they benefit beneficiaries, but also even animals. And um, so... This is what's behind the, the commandment originally for the Sabbath day when it says to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And the penalty for breaking the Sabbath was a big deal. It was punishable even by, by death. Now, as you and I look at this, and we think about this fourth commandment and the Ten Commandments and the original intent behind the Sabbath, the question becomes then, does this apply to me? Does this apply to us you know, now, or does this apply at all? And so let's go back to our two groups. And I'm sure there's more groups, but, but let's go back to two groups I mentioned. One group says that the Sabbath has now been moved from Sunday, from Saturday to Sunday, and it should still be observed by Christians everywhere. And um, the other group says, no, this is strictly an Old Testament command, part of the Mosaic Law. It's been done away with. We can just sort of pretend like it never happened. Well, uh, scripturally and practically, I think we can reject both those models. Okay, scripturally and practically. Let, let's start with the first group. This, we'll call it the Sunday Sabbath group. Okay, these are Christians with great intentions who want to honor God on the first day of the week, on Sunday, as the Sabbath. And they do this because, because Sunday became a day of worship for the early Christians. It became known as the Lord's Day. We know this not only from church history, but also from Scripture as well. And let me give you a few Scriptures. In, in, uh, Luke, in Acts chapter 20, Luke records one of Paul's missionary journeys. And he says this, On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. And so the early church, they met on Sunday. And one of the reasons that they met was for the Lord's Supper. By the way, for those of you who are new to our church and wonder why we take communion each week, this is, this is why. Water is, just as water is purest at its source, we want to emulate the practice of the early church the very best we can. And the Lord's Supper was a central piece 
in their worship each week, and it's a central piece in our worship each week as well. Uh, look, look at a couple other verses. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. says, Paul writes this, On the first day of the week, again, first day of the week, first day is Sunday, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. And so Paul tells the church at Corinth that when you come together as an assembly on Sunday, you be ready to, to give. Set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. So the early church, not only did they meet, and when they met, did they break bread and, and for teaching and prayer and fellowship, but also a collection was made for their ministry. Happened on the first day of the week. And then one more verse of Scripture. Revelation 1.10, John says this, On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. It, it was on a Sunday that John received his revelation from God. He called it the Lord's day. And so the Sunday is a special day. Because, because it's a day we assemble for worship. It's a day that we celebrate, we remember that Jesus has conquered His death. It's a day that we meet around the Lord's table. It's a day that we bring our tithes and offerings. It's a day that we hear the Word of God proclaimed. But, but, but don't be confused, church. It's, it's not the Sabbath. And the early church didn't, didn't treat it that way. And some will say, well, I, I know it's not the Sabbath. It's the fulfillment of the Sabbath, right? It's the fulfillment of the Sabbath day. But, but it's, that's not the case either. Do you know what is the fulfillment of the Sabbath? Or, or specifically who? Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. As Christians, we don't celebrate that we like the Israel, that we've been delivered from the bondage of slavery like the Israelites. We celebrate that we've been delivered from the bondage of sin. And so here's what's so great, and this is what I love about Scripture. This is what's so cool. See, the Sabbath was pointing to something bigger than itself. The Sabbath was, was, an, was a symbol that would help us to understand what Jesus would actually do someday. That He alone could provide not only our temporary rest, but our eternal rest. This is what the Hebrews author means when he says in Hebrews 4, 9, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. You know what he's talking about? He's pointing to eternity. He's talking about, he's talking about our eternal rest that's been made possible by Jesus. And that's why I often tell you, listen, that the Bible isn't just this big string of random stories that don't connect. This book from cover to cover, it's about Jesus. It's all about what God has been doing. And Jesus was the fulfillment of the Sabbath. And He made it possible for our rest. Now, let me say this. If you're convicted that Sunday is a day that you should observe as a Sabbath to the Lord, I would, continue to, I would, I would urge you to do just that. In fact, in just a moment, you're going to hear why I believe that you need a day of rest, that you need a Sabbath day, and that Sunday is the most logical day for that. Eric Liddell was a Scottish Olympian whose, move, whose life the movie uh, uh, Chariots of Fire was based off of. How many of you have seen that movie? Probably a lot of you. That's a movie, I, it's on my list. I haven't seen it, but it's an old movie, but I hear it's great. But he was scheduled to run the 100-meter relay in the 1924 Olympics. He was favored to win. But because the race was scheduled on Sunday, he refused to run. And when the race day came, instead of competing for a gold medal that was a temporary accolade, he was preaching in a church about a race with much more significance and a far greater reward. And if you're familiar with the story, Eric Liddell, he goes on to win uh, the bronze in the 200-meter race in the 1924 Olympics. And then on the day of the 400-meter race, Eric was standing on the starting block before he, before he was about to begin the race. One of the American runners, Jackson Skulch, gave him a piece of paper with a scripture verse. It was from 1 Samuel 2.30 from the Bible. It said this, Those who honor me, I will honor. And Eric ran with that piece of paper in his hand. He not only won that race, but he broke the existing world record with a time of 47.6 seconds. God used him. God used Eric Liddell and his convictions to bring him glory in a powerful way. And so if that's your conviction, hold on to it. Uh, it's fine. However, I would just simply say this. Don't make it an, area of, uh, an issue of salvation. Don't make it an issue of salvation. See, the only hope that you and I have for our uh, 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 salvation isn't in our ability to keep a Sabbath or any other law. Our only hope is in the Lord of the Sabbath. Our only hope for salvation is in Jesus. Okay? And I want you to understand that. I want, you to, I want you to know that. And so that's one side that you may have that people may line up on. The other side will be maybe this, is those folks that would have called the Sabbath No More group. 
And, and technically speaking, this group would be correct in saying that believers are not obligated to observe a Sabbath, that, that of the Ten Commandments, that this one specifically applied to Israel, part of the ceremonial law, there's a covenant between them and God, and because now we're under the new covenant with Jesus, that law is no longer applicable to us. And while this is true, and, and, and I want you to understand that Paul writes it like this in Romans 14. He says, one person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as a special day does so to the Lord. So that's what I'm saying. If you've got a conviction, follow through with it to the glory of God. But from this passage and from other passages, it makes it clear that the Sabbath day in terms of the law of Moses is no longer in effect. But here's the point I want to make to you today is that while the ceremonial aspect of the Sabbath has passed, the practical aspect remains. Ceremonially, the Sabbath was an Old Testament part of their law, but practically today, it is so important for us. From a practical standpoint, it just makes sense. From a practical standpoint, it makes sense that we need a day of rest. Amen? I mean, doesn't it? It's, it's kind of like sometimes people want to make an argument that Christians don't have to tithe anymore because it's, it's part of the Old Testament law. And, and I agree, we don't have a command in the New Testament saying that you, you have to give 10%. But doesn't it make sense with everything we know about God and everything that we know about history and what God has done in our lives that we would want to at least give 10% back? I mean, the standard's been set. That's why it just makes sense to follow. Same is true with the Sabbath. See, for the Jews, the Sabbath was synonymous with rest and worship. Do you realize how beneficial a day of rest and worship for you is each week? Do you understand this? I know I'm sort of preaching to the choir, but I think you're going to see it even more applicable here in just a moment. Every one of us need a Sabbath. And you'll see the benefits are so incredible. Let's start with the most obvious. First of this, taking a Sabbath day provides a day of much needed rest. It provides a day of much needed rest. Take a look at this video. This is the way I think that many of us Many of us are these days. She's sleeping. Yeah, well. She's sleeping on the camera. You ever feel like that? Yeah. I'm not going to say I've ever seen any of you do this in church, but hey, you get the point. All right, you get the point. Go ahead, that's good, buddy. But the Sabbath provides much-needed rest. I read this week about Maria Brunner of Germany. Her unemployed husband ran up $5,000 worth of unpaid parking tickets. She couldn't pay the fine. She worked hard cleaning the houses, but her husband, she, unless they were going to come up with the money, she was going to have to spend three months in jail because the car was in her name, and, and that she just couldn't pay for it. Do you know what she decided to do? She said she just would go to jail. She said this. She said, I, you know, uh, she couldn't pay the fine. And so finally, uh, she said, as long as I get food and a hot shower every day, I don't mind getting sent to jail. I finally get some rest and relaxation. The police reports that Maria repeatedly thanked them for arresting her. <laughs> now, if you sort of welcome the thought of going to jail... That means that you probably need some rest. That probably means that there's, that's a red flag. All right? That's a warning. And I know some of you moms with small children in the home, you feel like you never get a break rather than just a quick trip to the bathroom, right? And even then the kids are, what are you doing in there? I know, I know the routine. I know, I know how it works. But you, you, you have, if you've got a day that you set aside that you aren't running to the grocery store or you're not stressing over meals or you're not balancing the checkbook, you're not doing any of those things, I think that you'll actually find that life and even the kids are a little less demanding. Take a day of rest each week and when we do that, it just refreshes us. It helps us to enjoy life a little bit more. It's one of the benefits. Another benefit of taking a Sabbath each week is that it strengthens family ties. Not only will you find your kids to be a little less stressful, but your bond as a family will grow. Someone recently wrote, I had a power outage in my house this morning. And my PC, laptop, TV, DVD, iPad, and new surround sound music system were all shut down. Then I discovered that my iPhone battery was flat. To top it off, it was raining so I couldn't go for a walk, bike, or run. 
the garage door opener needs electricity, so I couldn't go anywhere in the car. I went to the kitchen to make coffee, and then I remembered that it also needed power. And so I sat down and talked with my wife for a few hours. She seems like a nice person. <laughs> now, what if for one day a week you us unplugged? As a family, you spent time together. And I know some of you think because we'll kill each other. I'm not saying it doesn't have to be the whole day, but maybe for two hours on Sunday, you turn the phone off, you take a ride, you go for a walk, you go to the park. Make it intentional. Something that you can do as a family each week. Or maybe if that's not the problem for you unplugging, maybe you take a break from something else. I heard about a family who, with teens, who decided that, that part of their Sabbath commitment was that they weren't going to criticize one another on Sundays. And as the months went on, the parents began to realize that there, more and more their children were, or their friends were actually coming over to their, to their house on Sundays. No one in their family had talked about or told what this commitment that they had made, but somehow the other teens, they just knew that this was a good place to be. A weekly Sabbath helps uh, us to strengthen family ties. Another thing it does is that taking a Sabbath makes us more productive when we work. Tim Kreider, who's a writer for the New York Times, he wrote this in an article called The Busy Trap. He said, idleness is not just a vacation, an indulgence, or a vice. It is as indispensable to the brain as vitamin D is to the body. And deprived of it, we suffer a mental affliction as disfiguring as rickets. It is paradoxically necessary to getting any work done. Have you ever noticed that you work better and more efficient with proper rest? I know I have. I don't know if this writer is a believer or not, but I think he gets it. He reminds us that our bodies need some downtime. I know that any time that I go a long period of time without a day off, that I am irritable, I get pessimistic, and I'm not much fun to be around. But on top of all of that, I'm not very productive. I'm just not very productive. I'm always more productive when I'm working toward a finish line. I know a day off is coming in the near future. Taking a Sabbath makes us more productive when we work. Another thing is, is that taking a Sabbath helps us put God first. It helps us put God first. I said that for the Jews earlier, the, the, the Sabbath was synonymous with rest and worship. And so for most of us, a natural day for the Sabbath is Sunday, right? This is the Lord's Day. This is a day we gather for worship. And not all of you, but most of you already have this day off. And do you understand that when we intentionally block off our Sunday mornings each week, and we guard this time against the things that might deter us, we're submitting to our Heavenly Father. And we're saying, Lord, God, I know I've got a lot. There's a lot I could be doing right now, including lying in bed, including other types of recreation. But I choose to worship you. I choose to put you first. And when we gather like this, the Lord speaks to our hearts, and we benefit in so many ways. And not only do we benefit from this time, but so do your children. I read an article this week online, uh, one of you posted it, and it talked about how many of our kids are leaving the church when they're older. And the point of the article was, was that, uh, that, that the church oftentimes is seeing that we're losing our young children because parents aren't teaching our kids what's most important. Carl uh, uh, Turman says this, If the sun shines out and their friends are going to the beach, do you decide to skip church and go to the beach? In, in which case, you send signals to your children that it's not that important. Now, I'm not saying that artificial church attendance is going to guarantee that your children are going to follow Christ or that you can never miss church. I'm just saying your kids are watching. And they're taking cues from you. And when they see you putting God first, they'll more likely to put God first in their future as well. Uh, it's a benefit of taking a Sabbath. Another benefit is taking a Sabbath each week reminds us that we're meant to be free. It reminds us that we're meant to be free. That passage I read earlier from Deuteronomy 5, God used the Sabbath for Israel to remind them that they'd been set free, that they were no longer slaves. And it's the same is true for us. When we take a Sabbath each week, it reminds us that we are meant to be free. Slaves don't get a day off from work. Now, this may be offensive for some. I hope not. But do you realize that if, if you're constantly working, you're working seven days a week, you're a slave. You're a slave. You say, well, it's paid off, right? I've got a lot of money in the bank. Well, okay, let me rephrase it. You're a rich slave, <laughs> all right? But you're a slave. And Matthew says it like this. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters. 
Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, I'm not saying you shouldn't work hard. Christians should be the hardest workers out there, period. And, and I'm not saying that it's wrong to make money or have a whole lot of money in the bank. I hope you do. I'm just simply saying don't let the money work you. Don't allow it to be in charge. You're meant to be free. You're meant to be free. Listen, God has set a standard in creation of, of, of working six days and taking one off. If your schedule is, ta- is, is packed tighter than God's, something's off. Okay? Something's off. A- another thing taking a Sabbath does is it helps us to trust God's provision. It helps us to trust God's provision. When we work hard for six days and intentionally take at least one day off, we're showing that we trust that God is big enough to handle our needs for day seven. Right? And listen, and literally, there's so many things that we could list here. We don't have time unless you're, you know, I know you want to get out and hit that restaurant, right? We don't have time. But we could list so many benefits here of the Sabbath. But let me give you a quick word of, of warning. If you take a Sabbath off each week, and and I hope that you will, don't make it legalistic. Don't make it legalistic. See, the problem that Jesus had with the Pharisees as it pertained to the Sabbath and Sabbath keeping is that they were making, turning it into something that God had never intended it to be. And as a result, the people were burdened with this huge list of things that they could or couldn't do on the Sabbath. And I, I don't want you to think of taking a Sabbath as a rule sheet. Like, I can do this, or I can't do this, or I can't do this. Your Sabbath day. Listen, if you relax by baking and spending time in the kitchen, go for it. But if you work in a restaurant five or six days a week, you probably need time out of the kitchen. For me, I spend a lot of time studying, and I'm in the office and a lot, and I, generally on my rest day, I don't want to think about anything. I just want to be outside, and so I, I like to get on my mower and just check out for a little while. It's refreshing to me. The point is, don't worry about a list of what you can or can't do. Find things that will refresh you, that will give you energy for another week. Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And then finally, taking a Sabbath reminds us of our future rest with Christ. When we take a Sabbath each week, and especially as we combine it with worship and rest and relaxing and and filling back up, it reminds us of our future rest with Jesus one day. Jesus' death provided a way for you and I to enter His rest, to enter uh, an eternal Sabbath that's been paid for by His blood. This is what the Sabbath has been pointing to the whole time our rest that we would, we would spend one day with God. And it's only been made possible through Jesus, through His death, burial, and resurrection. It's only been made possible by, as we remember this morning, what He has done for us. We've got an eternity to look forward to that. We have an eternity to look forward to His rest, but in the meantime, there's a lot of work to do. And you and I have been commissioned. We've been commissioned by God to take people to this rest with us. To help people know Him. To help people trust Him. And to help people know that peace that we talked about last week. This is what the Great Commission is all about. That's why you and, our, you and I now, we've got, we've got an eternity. We're looking forward to this rest one day. But right now we've got to work hard. And we've got to, we've got to get the good news out to as many as we can. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Him. Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you didn't know that you needed to, or maybe it was something that you're just sort of putting off. Well, today's the day. Today is the, today's the Lord's day. Today's the day that you, that, you can, that you can surrender your life to Him, receive His salvation, and be confident of that eternal Sabbath someday. Will you trust the Lord of the Sabbath? Will you trust the Lord of the earth? Will you trust the God and the God of the heaven who has created everything that we know and who loves you and is crazy about you? Scripture makes it pretty clear that we just simply trust in Him by believing in Him. We repent of our sins. We turn for those stones. We say, God, I know that I've been attracted to the world. I know that my mind, there's so many things that I've just... I've just wanted, Father, but I'm going to turn to you. My sin, all those things, God, I'm just going to repent. I'm going to walk in a different direction. Confess the name of Jesus. We're immersed into Christ. We we participate in his death, burial, and resurrection. If that's a decision that you need to make today, we're going to offer it to you. So many good things and so many promises that come with, with, with just that. 
Or today maybe you come and you want to make this your home church. Maybe this is a place where you want to worship and you want to work. And again, we, we're, it's important to rest one day of the week, but six days of the week we're working. And we're working and not only in, uh, for you know, our own personal deal, but especially for the kingdom of God. So maybe you, wanna, this wants to, you want this to be your place where you're working and serving uh, the Lord. If you've got a decision like that, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we'll invite you as we sing. Would you pray with me? Father God, we, um, we thank you for how you've just worked in us and you've revealed yourself to us all throughout time. And Lord, how you took a, a, a nation of people and you, and you were their God. And Lord, you used them to point uh, the rest of the world to you. And ultimately, you brought a Savior through those people, Jesus, our Savior. And Father, uh, it's in Him that we place our trust and we place our salvation and our hope for that future rest. God, I pray today if there's any here that need to make a decision to trust in You, that they would do so. And uh, Father, may all of us just trust You more uh, each day. We love You and we thank You. We pray all these things in Christ's name.